Okay, we'll start with this. Well, many of you may know by now that France is on my Hamadouche. Her Olympic journey has come to an end. She was eliminated at the Games by none other than Mira Potkonen, what I believe is a two-time Olympian, very experienced in the amateurs, a career amateur. Given Mira Potkonen's age, it's not likely that she ever goes pro, I don't think. She eliminated Maiva, who said this after suffering the defeat, I thank you for your messages of support during these Olympics. I don't understand the decision, but you have to accept it, not the choice. I learned a lot of things. I progressed. It's a great adventure. Meet me for my fight in the United States. Let's look ahead. Dake Jonovan, who's been covering these Olympics, added, Mira Potkonen is a 40-year-old mother of two who captured bronze in 2016. Maiva Hamadouche is a major titleist in the pros who had to readapt to the amateurs. They never stopped throwing punches in a furiously paced opening round. Maiva Hamadouche of Le France, Brown, Brown, reigning Brown. IBF super featherweight champion Maiva Hamadouche. Her participation in these Olympic Games was met with criticism from some and acceptance from some others because the pros and the amateurs, they really are different beasts. Though ultimately, there's nothing to mull over now as Maiva has been eliminated and her attention now turns to the upcoming unification match with America's own Michaela Mayer. And Maiva making it this far after having spent so many years as a professional, getting eliminated as an amateur, it's nothing to be ashamed of because they are different beasts. And Maiva making it this far is a testament to how good she is because she ain't some fighter with some deep amateur background. At least she wasn't ahead of these Olympic Games. So that she made it this far really is saying something, though Maiva is better suited for the pro ranks where she can accumulate damage round after round after more than just three rounds, the way it is in the amateurs. In the pro ranks, there are very little, very few girls that can take what Maiva's got. She came up against a very experienced amateur in Finland's own Mira Potkonen, a career amateur, in some ways a career Olympian. But I do wonder if Mira would find the same success in the pro ranks, trying to go the distance with a Maiva Hamadouche, who is pound for pound one of the biggest punchers in the entire sport of women's boxing. There aren't a lot of girls that can stop girls the way Maiva can stop girls. And I wonder if Mira... Yeah, you know, she found some success in the amateurs, and that's okay. She beat Maiva in the amateurs, but she, could she go 10 rounds with Maiva in the pros? That's the question. That's what Michaela Mayer has to do very soon. Try to. You're talking about three three-minute rounds in the amateur ranks. Maybe you can last that long with Maiva Hamadouche. Maybe you can hold your own. Maybe you can. But what about 10 two-minute rounds? What about that? But enduring the punishment that Maiva Hamadouche dishes out, for that amount of time. What if instead of nine minutes in the amateurs, you make that 20 minutes in the pros? Twice as much time in the ring with none other than Maiva Hamadouche. How do you hold up then? That's what Michaela Mayer will be facing very soon. And a big question lies over Michaela Mayer's head. Can she be the one that finally derails Maiva's reign as a champion? There's a difference between nine minutes and 20. This is a fight we're talking about after all. You're trying to hit and not get hit. That doesn't always work. As the fight progresses, fatigue starts to set in. You get a little slower, a little easier to target, a little easier to hit. This is what Michaela May is going to have to deal with. Maiva Hamadouche has a chin. She don't shy away from a shot. She might take one to give one because she knows she's got bigger guns than you do. What are you going to do, do about that, do about Kayla? Kayla? Of course, Kayla? she's your Kayla? problem now. She's got you in her sights. In other news, per tweet from Michael Benson, Eddie Hearn has declared that he thinks Dimitri Bivial at light heavyweight will be the front runner to fight Canelio Alvarez next. If Canelio chooses to stick to his September 18th plan, another option is to try and revive Caleb Plant talks for a later date this year. Everything Boxing tweeted Eddie Hearn on Canelo's next fight. I talked to Saul and Eddie Reynoso last night. We talked about some other opponents. There's been some discussions with Dimitri Bivol over the last few weeks. Bivol would be that front runner. He's the guy I put forward this night. To that, Steve Kim tweeted. So the people with Dimitri Bivol tell me that yes, they have been talking to Canelo's side. They are ready and willing to make a deal for September 18th. They want to make a deal ASAP and get this going. Just like that, Caleb Plant and the people over there at the PBC find out that they're not only expendable, 
They're very expendable. Replaceable at the feet eight, eight, of eight, boxing's eight. cash cow in this part of the world, in this country. If Canelo Alvarez takes an interest in you, if you're that fucking lucky that he wants anything to do with you, you give him what he wants, how he wants it, or he walks. Because all of you guys are interchangeable. For every guy out there that wants a Canelo Alvarez fight, or at least for every guy that says he wants one, there's another guy just like him who might be more willing, who might have a team behind him that doesn't get in the way of the fight the way that Caleb Plant's team is getting in the way of the fight. I mean, look, I don't even know how much of the blame we can assign to Caleb because I don't know if he even has the liberty to make decisions. If you ask me, I don't think he does. I don't think he has much of any say-so in the matter. I think all his decisions are made for him because the fight happening on Fox seems non-negotiable where it should not be. Caleb should have the liberty, should have the freedom to pursue a career high purse on the zone the same way he could have got one on Fox. If things aren't working out with Fox, okay, you take the fight to the zone. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Not so easy for Caleb, apparently. It's either the fight happens on Fox or the fight don't happen for him. Listen, we've been all through that the last couple of videos. We don't have to spend any more time on the blame game because ultimately we know who the paying public is going to side with and we know why. A Canelo Alvarez fight has never fallen apart before, never experienced these kinds of issues, nor should he be experiencing these kinds of issues when he is both a network and promotional free agent. But that's what happens when you deal with the PBC. That's what happens when you deal with PBC fighters. Moving on. We have to evaluate Dimitri Bivol versus Caleb Plant. As an opponent option for Canelo Alvarez, which opponent is the better opponent? Which fighter is the better fighter? Which guy, respectively, has proven more in their respective weight classes? It being that they're both unbeaten champions, one at 175 pounds and the other at 168. Who's got the better resume and who poses more of a threat to Canelo? than the other and I think you'll find in most boxing circles that Dimitri Bivol is actually viewed as the better, more proven fighter, even though neither guy is all that well known. And neither guy brings all that much more to the table, aside from their alphabet title, aside from their belt, neither guy brings all that much to the table. I mean, there's nothing that Caleb brings to the table that Dimitri Bivol doesn't bring to the table. The difference is that Dimitri Bivol and his team seem more eager, more willing, without all of the sticking points, without all of the issues. And Dimitri is a naturally bigger guy than Caleb Plant. Oh. Moreover, he's more proven at 175 than Caleb is at 168. Have you seen Dimitri Bivol's resume? Have you seen whose names are on there? Felix Valera, Sullivan Barrera, Isaac Chalemba, Joe Smith Jr. Jean Pascal. That's right. Before Jean Pascal found <laughs> the fountain of youth, as it were, ran back over there to the PBC side of things and dished out a loss to Badu Jack and, and a loss to Marcus Brown. Before any of that happened, Dimitri Bivol dished out a loss to that same Jean Pascal. I think a lot of people conveniently forget that Dimitri Bivol has one of the most solid, robust resumes in the light heavyweight division. A more robust body of work than Caleb Plant has amassed as a super middleweight, as a super middleweight champion. I will admit that Caleb Plant did beat Jose Uskateki to become that division's IBF champion, but who did Jose Uskateki beat? Nobody. He picked up the vacant IBF title after James DeGale vacated it to go fight Chris Eubank Jr. The best win on Caleb's resume is a guy with a thinner resume than him. I will admit that Dimitri Bivol didn't beat the WBA champion to be the WBA champion because, you know, Andre Ward, he retired as super champion, retired a unified champion, better still, Andre Ward retired, and that left Badu Jack as the only reigning champion in the light heavyweight division by way of the WBA at the time. And Badu Jack made the decision to vacate that title that he was holding on to. And, you know, Dimitri was his mandatory, but because the fight didn't happen, because Badu Jack vacated the title, Dimitri was elevated to champion. With that, and Andre Vard having retired, Dimitri Bivol became that division's 
WBA champion. But since then, a lot has happened, a lot of fights, and he's proven himself as a champion in defending that title against quality opponents, quality competition, like Joe Smith Jr., who went on to become a champion himself by way of the WBO, like Jean Pascal, who, after Dimitri beat him, went on a tier. Whether or not that tier was fueled by gear, your guess is as good as mine. But either way, Dimitri beat that guy with Marcus Brown and Badu Jack could not. Dimitri Bivol is a far superior opponent choice to Caleb Plant, in spite of Caleb being the last missing puzzle piece to the undisputed crown at 168 pounds. And we can sit here and continue to mull over how it is that Caleb and the PBC overplayed their hand, but that much is obvious already. Bivol is actually a better opponent choice, a better opponent option, even than Caleb Plant was. Caleb's loss is Dimitri's gain. And whether or not they will revisit the Caleb Plant fight, see about scheduling it for a later date. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not presumptuous enough to try to forecast that. I think it's going to be very telling who Canelo Alvarez fights next and whether or not it's going to be Dimitri Bivol because Gennady Golovkin is a viable option as well. And that is a commercially bigger fight than either the Bivol or Caleb Plant fights would be. However, Bivol would be an interesting choice and, and where he fights Bivol because he could move up and challenge Bivol for his WBA title or Dimitri could move down, it being that Dimitri himself expressed an interest in moving down to super middleweight to fight either Canelo Alvarez or the then reigning WBA champion Callum Smith. Dimitri Bivol out of his own mouth said he'd be willing to move down for those fights. So that's a possibility as well. Dimitri's a cerebral boxer the same way Caleb is. He's just better at it against better quality of competition. Good choice. What, what becomes, becomes of the broken hearted who had love but now departed? I'm gonna have to find some kind of peace of mind. Uh. Where does Caleb Plant go from here? Your guess is as good as mine. They are talking about revisiting the fight after all. It's dead for now as far as the 18th. That's what the story seems to be. But it doesn't have to be completely dead. Caleb Plant just has to hang on to that IBF title long enough for Canelo to revisit the fight. Though whether or not he actually will, that's another question entirely. It's not called the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for nothing, sweetheart. Canelo Alvarez might not revisit the talks. He might not double back, revisit the fight. If he decides to move up and wait, take on Dimitri Bivol, who says that doesn't herald the beginning of a light heavyweight campaign to become that division's undisputed champion? They already expressed an interest in potentially facing Bivol, and that interest is mutual. Bivol is interested in facing Canelo. If he moves up for that fight, who says that doesn't kick off the campaign to become an undisputed champion at 175 pounds, which is a much less political division than 168 has become as of late, because it was all going so well! Till the PBC got involved. We don't know if he's gonna double back. So in the mean, in between time, what does Caleb Plant do? Who does Caleb Plant fight? The PBC cannot present to him a fight of greater, greater. than or equal value to what the Canelo fight would have been for him. Hell, even if the fight took place on the zone, they still wouldn't be able to substitute the kind of money he'd make on the zone on their side of things. So what does Caleb do? Well, a couple of names are being floated out there by the fight fans and the pundits and people still interested in Caleb. One of two names. The name of David Benavidez, an obvious choice, and Jermall Charlo. I want you guys to understand something. As a hardcore boxing fan that follows the sport closely, I can actually appreciate those two fights in spite of what's happened. I could still go for Caleb Plant versus David Benavidez or Caleb Plant versus Jermall Charlo, but realistically, I know that those fights don't present the value to Caleb and Caleb's bank account that that Canelo fight would have been. So if commercial value is the subject, no, there's nothing, absolutely nothing, the PBC can substitute for Canelo Alvarez. That's the biggest fight you could have had, and it's dead, at least for now, based on reports. You can fight David, you can fight Jamal, and commercially, I think those fights could do relatively well. I think the Benavidez fight does better numbers than the Jamal Charlo fight, but the Benavidez fight is actually a much riskier fight than the Charlo fight. If you want my honest opinion, I think David Benavidez beats Caleb Plant. <laughs>
Does Caleb want to run those kinds of risks right now? And does his team. You swap out the Canelo fight, a fight that you very well could have lost, would have lost, for another fight that you could lose, but this fight pays substantially less than that fight. Do you do that, or do you take your chances with Jermall Charlo, who failed to stop the unheralded Juan Montiel in the middleweight division? The Jermall Charlo that very recently has taken a liking to calling Caleb Plant out. Out of those two guys, who do you fight? I'm sure that Jermall Charlo is more receptive to a Caleb Plant fight than he is to a David Benavidez fight. He's taken that off the table for now, even though he's the one that got the ball rolling for that. He's the one who initiated things with that call out last year. But here today in 2021, I'll tell you, I think he's more receptive to a Caleb Plant fight than a David Benavidez fight. And I think the same might be true for Caleb. I think Caleb might be more receptive to a Jermall Charlo fight than a David Benavidez fight in an effort to deliver a uh, decent-sized pay-per-view to the higher-ups at Fox. Might do this. They might so decide to stage Caleb Plant versus Jermall Charlo as a Fox pay-per-view, and yeah, it is a decent-sized fight. I don't think it's the kind of fight that cracks 500,000 buys. I don't. To be honest, I think they'd be lucky to get 350,000 buys. But the fight itself don't cost much to put together. Because these two guys, they're small potatoes, small fries. They don't come with the big cash guarantees that a Canelo Alvarez warrants, that a Canelo Alvarez demands. No, 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 not these two guys. The guarantee prices to either of these two guys could be as low as two million for Caleb and one million for Jamal, or, or three million for Caleb, the reigning champion, and what would be yeah, one, two million for Jamal, the challenger. The operational costs for a fight like this are much lower than the offer of Canelo fight. You don't have to pull together as many resources to pay these two guys because neither one of these two guys are all that big a draw. You don't get that much guaranteed at a time anyway. So maybe this is next.